we have this notion of post-digital, and we talk about this word all the time, post-digital, in our photo montage representation, presentation. But first we need to figure out what the whole idea of post-digital means. And in order to do that, we need to first look at digital and what digital means. And so when we talk about digital rendering or digital perspective, this is typical of what we would see when we go online. Mm -hmm. And we see stuff like this as well, and stuff like this, and stuff like this. And you'll notice that everything really does start to feel very, very similar. There's a lot of sameness going on. Renders, because they're coming through a rendering software, which has the same embedded materials for you that it does for the other million users across the planet, everything does start to look and feel very much the same. And for some people who just want economy of scale and they want to get their apartments as cheap as possible to make as much money as possible, perfectly fine way to get your images out there. For us, when we're trying to be expressive of our ideas and we're trying to be unique, not really working. So what about interior? interiors? Surely they're more unique. If you put this into Google, this is what comes up first, apartment interior render. You notice that everything starts to feel very much the same. It's the same gray beiges, it's the same pine woods, it's the same black fixtures, it's the same brass fittings over and over and over again. Once again, because they're using the same software, the same library parts, the same components as everybody else. So we get this sameness-itis, or what I call Revit-itis. It's just the same library parts used all the time. It's a bit crap. The sameness is only half the problem. The other half is completeness. So there's no room for development left in a digital perspective like this. Right? It's very much finished. It feels done, finito, finite. So the conversation turns away from space and light and experience in architecture and the poetry, the atmosphere, all those wonderful things we want to talk about, and instead shifts to, I'm not so sure about that green kettle. Those chairs look Danish. Are they Danish? I want handles on the top drawers. Don't you want handles? And so we stop talking about the architecture and we start to talk about what we see in the render because it's photo real. So we're no longer questioning concept. We're no longer questioning space, form, light material, all of those wonderful things from atmospheres because what we see is what we get. So this is the other problem. We have sameness. It looks the same as what everybody else does. And we have completeness. There's no room left for design. Whereas what we do in collage is a design tool. There's plenty of room left in it, intentionally because it's unfinished. It's partway through the design and we're just talking about concepts and philosophy and ideas. This is why post-digital collage is so important to us, because it's past the digital. We're not talking about things that are finished, we're talking about things that are open-ended. This is why post-digital collage is the antidote to sameness and completeness. So let's take a step back and we'll walk through the history of collage together. All right, the first thing we need to acknowledge is the pre-colonial traditions uh, across the timeline of collage. So collage, as we know it and think about it, is this thing of cutting things out and sticking them together, uh, mostly shaped by Western ideals of art and that tradition. But before that, of course, in China and Japan, they were cutting up paper and they were cutting up calligraphy and putting it together to form artworks. And so there was collage before we have this rounded term of what collage is. And it's important for us as designers and thinkers to recognize and acknowledge that. So if we can table that, acknowledge that for now, what we're going to talk about today is the Western view of collage. But there is another view there as well. OK, so collage from English to French. Nowadays, collage just means collage to us. But if you go away from the noun and instead look at the verb, the verb of collage from French to English is to glue or to stick. And that really helps us thinking about this idea of collage because we're cutting things out and then we're gluing them together or we're sticking them together. And just keep that in the back of the mind as we look through this history. So the first point really in this Western version of collage is cubism. Early 20th century movement in art, especially in painting, in which perspective with a single viewpoint, remember this we talked about a couple of weeks ago, was abandoned and use was made of simple geometric shapes, interlocking planes, and then later collage. So let's have a look at some examples. We've got George Brack, 
And so here we have charcoal and paper cutouts. We're playing with geometry and form. We all know at this point by 1913 how to draw beautiful landscape, how to draw portraits, how to draw things with perspective. We're trying to shift beyond that. And in order to do that, we're going backwards a little bit. Now we're going back to rudimentary geometry, but we're taking different elements and pieces together and applying them in such a way that the composition has meaning. Another one here again, charcoal and paper cutouts. Another one again, beautiful stuff. And we move on to Picasso, this time oil painting. We've got oil cloth, which has a cane pattern printed onto it. We've got newspaper cutouts, and then we've got rope wrapping around the edge of the canvas instead of traditional framing. So we're collaging things together, we're sticking them, we're gluing them together. Again, very famous Picasso. This is before his guitars painting series. He did this to express himself and try to figure out what guitars mean to him. And he's kind of dissecting that and pulling it apart. And we get this expressive dissection of what guitars mean and what they look like and what they might become. And then, of course, if you know the later series, we can see this is that starting point, that first spark of the idea. Then we move into Dadaism, which is a movement in art and literature based on deliberate irrationality, deliberate irrationality and negation of traditional artistic values. So Francis Pacabia, Ava, how do you pronounce that last one? Pacabia, there we go. So cut and pasted printed paper with ink. So remember, what we're doing here is we're being deliberately irrational, okay? And so we have this Tableau Rasta Dada is the artwork. This is his self-portrait. Everyone else at the time is drawing beautiful oil on canvas self-portraits of themselves. He takes a photo of himself out of a newspaper, takes photos of women's heels, and his self-portrait is to say that he is a bit of a charlatan and basically everything that everyone's already saying about him, he then says about himself and makes an artwork out of that forming the collage. You can see, if you look carefully, he's even cut his own eye out and turned it slightly on the side as if to raise one eyebrow to the public and to the people looking back at him. So it's very much commentary. His pipe is coming out of his nose instead of his mouth. There's a lot of play here. And if you think about the time that we're talking about, 1920, deliberate, deliberate irrationality is being in, intentionally obtuse. Kurt Schwitters. This time, instead of cutting out bits of paper and bits from newspaper, we're now starting to play with objects that don't normally belong together, but put together in this way become an expression of an idea. Hannah Hutch, cut paper elements. So looking at this image is a real nice depiction of what Dadaism is. It's intentionally bizarre. Right? It's making us think about the objects. We know that this scale of this person is wrong. The hand is too big. We know that these faces don't belong together. These wings don't belong on the side of a head on that tiny little body there. We can't make out what this landscape is. Is this supposed to be the edge of a beach or a cliff or water? Is it a landscape? Is it something else altogether? So it's intentionally obtuse. Right? We're pulling things and pieces together in order to project some form of narrative or commentary. Then we push forward into surrealism, 20th century avant-garde movement in art and literature, which sought to release the creative potential of the unconscious mind. For example, the irrational juxtaposition of images. So surrealism is probably my favorite of the series. Uh, and that's because you can think of it very much as a dreamlike state, surrealism. So if you've ever woken up from a crazy dream where you started off, you were having a normal day, then you fell down a cliff and started flying, all of a sudden you were coming off the pages of a book and then you woke up doing something even crazier and now you're a fire engine and next minute you're a tree. This is the thing that happens all the time in our subconscious, of course. Surrealism is about taking that out of here, all of that crazy, bizarre weirdness and then turning it into some sort of conceptual ideation as an idea. 
and that is the collage of surrealism. So we can see this image here uh, is the subterranean underwater constellation. So we're combining different worlds together. We're deep, deep undersea. So we've got these, um, what are they called? The lanternfish with the crazy sharp teeth in the head. So we know we're underwater here, but we're juxtaposing that against the skyline and the galaxy. And then we have this floating mermaid unicorn person. Bizarre, intentionally bizarre, pulling things together. Dreamlike state, that's surrealism. Surrealism was also very much counter to culture. So at this time, 1932, we're starting to shift away from um, church and state being one thing and separating them into forming what we now know as democratic system away from church and state. So there was a lot of argument at the time through art because you weren't really allowed to say it, particularly in the fascist states. Look at what year it is, 1932. You weren't really allowed to say it in the newspaper. You weren't really allowed to say it to your friends and family. So art became the medium through which we can express the need to separate religion from our democratic values and system. And then finally, we move and shift into Salvador Dali, the epitome of surrealism. And you all know that painting of the scream or the melting clocks. Uh, and then we have this one, the great masturbator in the sky. So at the time, we are having what they called a sexual revolution. And so we've got Freud coming out and telling everybody that it's okay to be a sexual being. And so the art that's coming off the back of that is very much about that. But again, in the mainstream, we can't have these conversations. We can't talk about this. We can't be open about it. So collage is the medium through which we can start to express ourselves and these ideas. Then we move into the 50s, into abstract expressionism. The development of abstract art, which originated in New York, aimed at subjective emotional expression with particular emphasis on the spontaneous creative act. They call this action painting. A really good example of this is Jackson Pollock, if anyone knows Jackson Pollock. And so it became, instead of making an artwork, the artwork itself was the process of making art. So throwing art at a painting became the artwork. So it wasn't about painting something. The something is the artwork. So that's what you can think of in terms of action painting. We're trying to be expressive of an emotive quality, which should ring bells for what we're talking about this semester. We're trying to be expressive about what we see in the architecture. What's the color? What's the composition? What's the emotion we try and get across? And so we have collages like this one here. We're no longer creating an image as a representation of something that should be recognized. There's no people, there's no faces. We're playing with pure geometry, with texture, with color, form, and composition in order to express some sort of emotion. And so you do get some emotion coming out of this when compared to something like this. Very different in terms of the emotional content that comes out of it, but much like Jackson Pollock, it's not about the image, it's about the action of making this. So if his action was to put paint into a hot dog squeezy bottle and throw it all over the canvas or drip it slowly over the canvas, that was his action. And then the outcome was the action of that. This, Lee Krasner's version, is to haphazardly hack away at newspapers and magazines and different things. And so that expression of hacking away, that anger, that sadness, that bitterness, whatever comes out of that, turns itself into this painting. Okay, so the emotion, the quality of what you're going through in terms of that action is what's being delivered ultimately as the artwork itself. Now we're shifting into pop art. So we're coming off the back of the 50s, pushing into the 60s and 70s. Art based on modern popular culture and the mass media, especially critical and ironic commentary on not only traditional fine art values, cultural and societal norms at the time. We still see a lot of this in the way our generation creates art and media now. While it might not be so expressive in terms of the poppy colors, we still have that commentary of uh, societal and cultural values. So Rosalind Drexler at the time, very much expressive of what's going on. So 
King Kong is out at the cinemas at the time. We're juxtaposing that with um, cutouts from magazines and the text, which turns itself into a very, very expressive image. This one, a personal favourite of mine, Martha Rosler. Uh, so she was poking fun at the magazine Home Beautiful. So in the magazine Home Beautiful, it's all about women who have to stay at home and look at this wonderful vacuum you've got. You can clean up your house and make it beautiful for your husband. Her collage is throwing that on its head and saying that, well, you've got this beautiful home, but actually right now what's going on, look at the date, we're fighting a war that we don't want to be involved in in Vietnam. And so I'm going to bring that front line into your home in Home Beautiful and then you tell me how beautiful your home really is. So we're having very much a conflicting argument. Home Beautiful is about sheltering people. It's about making them feel oppressed. It's about making them feel like they belong in a certain situation. Martha Rosler is trying to wake them up and shake them out of that spell so that they can start to think about what's going on in the world. Then we shift into contemporary art, which contemporary art is very important to understand, concerns time, not style. Time, not style. So contemporary art just means people who are still alive today. A lot of people get confused and they think that the words contemporary and modernism or modern are interchangeable. Modern refers to the time 20s and 30s coming out of the Bauhaus. Contemporary refers to things that are happening right now. So make sure you understand the difference between those two. All right, so we'll see a lot of this. This is the, stu the stuff that we're starting to see more and more of on Instagram and Pinterest now, which we're playing around with photo montage. So photo montage as opposed to photo collage means we're pulling different photos together and digitally making artworks that maybe are impossible, maybe are bizarre, all of the things that we've seen from previous stylistic endeavors back through to cubism. Lovely stuff. Still playing with geometry, still playing with colour, going back into 50s and 60s in some ways, and then pushing forwards into 70s, 80s, 90s in other ways again, in terms of the cultural symbols that we see in the imagery. Very common these days, where we'll juxtapose two different objects together in order to convey a narrative. Okay, so we have obviously these para-soldiers uh, para coming down, something serious is going to happen when they land, but then we compare that to this landscape, which is their parachutes there. Again, Louisa, just because I love her work, beautiful. Okay, so certainly impossible, but the way in which it's collaged together for a moment makes it feel like it is real. And that's coming back to the surrealist once again. So because the composition is so strong, because it's so well done, we can convince ourselves, even if just for a moment, that this narrative is possible. This one again, so shifting away slightly a little bit from photo montage, this time is pressed ferns. So taking one object and then combining it in such a way that it creates a new object. And then photo montage, another one where we start to not only refer back in stylistic ways to uh, art of the past, but in literal ways. So we can see this face here. Does anyone recognize where this face is from? Who wants to say? Not you, Ava. Yep. Yeah, Venus by? Yep, Birth of Venus by Botticelli. Very good. And so we can see this artwork is taking that stylistic output from Cubists and Dadas, but also the literal artwork from that as well. And so it's starting to overlap on top of itself. So that's the history of collage from how it started. And again, this is just the Western viewpoint of that to where we are now. So photo montage technique of architecture borrows from everything that we've done. So all of this is available to you. So we've got ignoring the single perspective and playing with geometry. We've got deliberate irrationality and negation of traditional fine art values. We've got whimsical and dreamlike uncanny juxtaposition from the surrealist. Expression of action with emphasis on colour, composition and emotion. 
and then critical or ironic commentary on popular culture and societal values. All of this stuff is available to you to play with in terms of creating your perspectives for assignment two for your house. All right, let's go through some architectural examples. Now, most of these are taken directly from the Pinterest link that's on Blackboard, so you can go back through them anytime. Under unit materials, that's called post digital examples. Click on that, and it'll take you there. So I'll go through these pretty quickly, but try to see the cues of everything that we've been talking about before in terms of the geometry, the form, the juxtaposition of color, the randomness, the texture, the fact that this isn't actually a real object, it's just sitting in space. All of these elements that we've talked about before should be coming through and realized as part of the architectural expression. Nice image. So surrealist tones. We know that this light isn't really possible. It's just kind of sitting in there. We've got the composition of the rule of thirds, one, two, three. The colors, the way that the children are placed, even the geometry starting to come through. So we can see this triangular pattern motif coming across the floor there to represent the dappled lighting of the set of blinds, but in such a way that pays homage back to the geometry of earlier collage. One point perspective paying this time more reference to the surrealist. So an impossible space to create with Elevant here floating over the top of a paper thin pool which has fish underneath it, birds flying through the sky, very much dealing with just raw elements of color stitched together in such a way that it starts to tell us about space. Surrealist once again. Beautiful play in where the architecture and the perspective end. So we can see these elements. The floor doesn't actually finish like that. A floor, of course, would come all the way to the edge. And the same thing with these chairs would finish all at the same level. And the structural system would finish all at one line as well. But we're intentionally pulling away from that to prick the attention in terms of what the geometry is doing and where it's going, what it's looking at. Surrealist, once again, everything's washed out, everything's at one level, but we're playing with perspective as well in terms of what the vanishing point's doing, in terms of the fact that we're slightly off kilter in terms of the ground line and what the people are doing relative to what's going on in terms of the space. Nice composition. One of my favorites, definitely I get dreamlike qualities out of this. To me, this pool could also be a sky in there in terms of the way that's laid out, in terms of the way that the reflection's working, the juxtaposition of this floating person that kind of looks like that iconic superwoman slash superman stance of flying through the air. Very nice. Uh, now starting to play with grain and texture. We can see once again that we're pulling away from that one point perspective. So Back to the cubus again, we've got a vanishing point this way, got a vanishing point over there, another one going back to this point up there as well. Again, playing with multiple vanishing points. If we look at what's going on in the background in this elevation, we're at one flat plane, whereas what our eyes pulled down to here is at a different vanishing point inside there. So we all of a sudden have this uncanny sensation that we want to fall into the image purely by the nature of this change of vanishing point from here to here. Again, playing with the ideas of geometry. In this sense, it feels as though each element has been painted in. And so while this is created in Photoshop, they've done it in such a way that it feels like a manual collage, like they've cut everything out. They've created these gaps in between intentionally. They've made reference to uh, Charles and Ray Eames case study 52 house, but everything else is out of the ordinary. This landscape doesn't look like it belongs with this landscape that's over here. There's lots going on in terms of the way it's put together, but because of the balance of the collage, it feels like it's one space. Again, playing with geometry and lightness. Now starting to collage hand drawing back over the top of the original image, while also playing with these floating geometries, objects in space. 
image that feels like an Edward Hopper painting in this middle zone. But once again, because of the floating carpet, because of how the texture has been put onto the floor at this point, it starts to feel like it's folding down towards us. It's not quite right. The use of framing and how we're showing one room in there versus this stage that we're in. So now we're starting to talk about thresholds and architectural moments. But all that's really done is they've placed a shape over the top of a collage. So this collage, the perspective, is all there in the background. But what we've done is we've just placed this over the top of that. And then all of a sudden we get this impression that we're standing inside a threshold. Nice grainy texture. I love the color and proportion, sorry, of this one here, very much reminding me of pop art, in terms of the play of primary colors of geometry, of these very, very simple forms, circle, square, arch, triangle, very nice. This one here feels like, to me, like a David Hockney painting, like Splash or California Bungalow, where we've got this one third, two third, this car is not in the same place as plain as the house itself, and it's just been perfectly reversed back into the image. Really nice. Again, this one I love because if you look carefully, all that's actually going on here is one texture, two textures, and then they've just cut a strip out of each of those textures and created this ribbon, which happens through here. And then they've very carefully collaged in one at a time these little plants in here. And all of a sudden, the sequence of the garden becomes really important to the image in the house. Nice. Surrealism, once again, is this a roof or is this a sky? We've got a plane flying through here. We've got stars over above. These trees are starting to feel like columns. Why can we see space over there in the background, which is yellow, but we've got this pink mass above us? Bizarre, but beautiful nonetheless. Odd juxtaposition of cartoon people versus realistic garden trees and geometry. Feels almost naive and whimsical, like a kid's book collage. Warped perspective again. And another one point surrealist, 100% impossible bedroom right in the middle of the space here next to the pool. People all over the place. None of the people line up in terms of the one point perspective. Nice collage again. And I'll skip through the rest, running out of time. Right. So the important part is that there's more than one way to make a collage and that all the examples look different. And so you're probably asking, what are the rules? Really, that there's no rule except for composition rules and proportion rules. So you need to make sure that you have balance in your composition and proportion in everything you do. And so this is something that's going to take a little while. It's going to take a bit of practice, and it's going to take a few goes before you get things working. And you might really love a texture that you cut out, but it just might not work with the balance and proportion of the image. And so you have to be willing to let things go that you really like if it doesn't work with the whole image overall because composition and proportion rules. Beyond that, any of the previous qualities and styles that we looked at are available to you. So if you like the dreamlike qualities, if you like the irreverence, the pop art, the expressive motive qualities, you can play with all of that. Put it together. You can even collage multiple styles and ideas together. There's no rules, just proportion and composition. All right, I very quickly want to show you one of your third year peers, one of my students who was in third year last year, and how she used post-digital collage in her excellent submission. So I won't go through the details of what she was doing in her architecture, but you can see very much how expressive she is and the surrealist qualities that come through her work, marrying very nicely with architectural form to give us an impression of what it might be like to be there. But it's not renders. It's not those awful renders we looked at at the start of this lecture. Instead, they're collages, which may or may not be the case, but they give an impression of what it feels like to be there and occupy that space. What's important about the architecture, what the light's doing, what are the atmospheric qualities of what's going on. 
Right. So one more time, difference between atmospheric and post-digital collage. So atmospheric drawings that we looked at last week, all about light, shadow, texture, and material. They look more realistic because they're constrained to what's actually happening. They're usually used in plan sections and elevations. That's this that we looked at last week. Post-digital collage is all about communicating an impression. Okay, so it's not realistic. The qualities, the concepts, the social context, a commentary on what's going on. And this might be a commentary of what's going on in your life and our lives culturally, socially, what's going on. It doesn't have to be relevant to the architecture itself because the architecture is giving you an impression. What is that impression and how can you express yourself? Elements are intentionally unrealistic, mismatched or unrelated, but through their composition and proportion form a harmonious relationship. That's what we're looking for. They often feel whimsical or dreamlike, thanks to the cubist, dadaist, surrealist, and abstract expressionist beginnings. Something like this. So that's post-digital collage. Now, first note, the first collage you make won't be the best one. Like any design exercise, making multiple attempts is going to improve your outcomes. We want you to play with different cut-out elements and experiment with what works and doesn't work. Remember, composition and proportion are king. If the elements you're sticking aren't working, move on to something else. Note two, collage is the antidote to sameness and completeness. This is your opportunity to be unique and express your impression. Collage is a design tool, not a presentation tool like rendering. It shouldn't look like a finished thing. It should look like something that alludes to an architecture response. That means you can use collage halfway through the project to help test ideas. So collage is something that you can use to figure out what you're doing in your architecture. If you're at a point where the plan and the section are only getting you so far and you feel like you're starting to spin your wheels, you can use collage to test and see how that works and what it might look like. Because you can take bits and pieces of other buildings. You can take bits and pieces of texture and, and color and newspaper and whatever and stick that together and go, ah, oh, OK, I can see now. I need to do X, Y, Z to my plan and section to make it work. Finally, have fun. It's an opportunity to express yourself freely. Enjoy the process of experimenting and mixing your media. So collect as much as you can. Go online, cut out all sorts of bits and pieces, textures, colors, geometries, whatever. And have fun with it. You can even cut out existing artworks from history and put it into your collage.